Namaste everyone, our honourable dignitaries and our fellow thinkers. Welcome to Vichar Manthan. My name is uh, Kishan Bhatt and I am part of the Vichar Manthan Central London team. So what is Vichar Manthan? Vichar Manthan is a Sanskrit phrase meaning to churn ideas. For short, Vichar Manthan has active chapters here in London, London West, Leicester, Nottingham, and emerging chapters all across the country. Vichar Manthan is a platform to explore the challenges facing British society on the whole through a Hindu civilizational lens. Ultimately, we at Vichar Manthan believe that there is much wisdom that can be unlocked from Hindu culture. And if we engage with it earnestly, it can be applicable to solve so many of our challenges in facing Britain today. Vichar Manthan is a voluntary organization, and to that end, we are funded by well wishers. That is, people like you who contribute on a monthly basis to our fund. So, if after the event you would like to offer your skills, your time, or your money to Vichar Manthan, then please come and find me or speak to any of our team members here today. Vichar Manthan does attract the sharpest minds to come onto its platform and explore the challenges we face in modern Britain. We have in the past explored everything from the welfare state to the legislation facing caste uh, and also prostitution to animal rights and education. To find out more, do please visit our website, vicharmanthan.org forward slash social media to check all our social media pages. So tonight we are here of course to explore the limitations of both socialism and capitalism if there are any, as practiced in the United Kingdom over the last three decades or so, and critically examine a radical third way, a possible radical third way, being developed in India called integral humanism. A theory first talked about in a series of seminal lectures in the 1950s by a little known uh, economist by the name of Sri Dindalji Upadhyay. So today we are asking the crucial question at the forefront of our society today. Is socialism the right answer for the apparent failure of capitalism, or is there a genuine third way? Perhaps the development of thought in centrism that was pertinent once in the Blair and Clinton years is now extinguished, and, it's, and we are begging to replace it. Which is right? What path ought Britain take? Is there a real third way? And by exploring this third way, we examine the work of Sri Dindayalji Upadhyay, who began writing in the 1950s, who made us start to find a new way to think about the relationship between capital and labor, the importance of addressing equality in society, and the need to consider education as a matter of importance in the theory that he coined integral humanism. Today, the Indian government, under Prime Minister Modi, is beginning to translate the thoughts of Upadhyay G in policy. So a little introduction to our speakers. Um, we've got Mr. Andrew Harrop, who's the Director General of the Fabian Society. Uh, Andrew's been the General Secretary of the Fabian Society since autumn 2011, and in that time has led the Society's research on economic and social policy, as well as the future of the Labour, Labour Party. He was previously Director of Policy and Public Affairs for Age UK and has been a Labour Party activist since, he was, since the age of 18 and was also a parliamentary candidate in the 2005 general election. We also have to his right Dr Jamie White, who is the Research Director at the Institute for Economic Affairs. Dr Jamie White is, uh, since 1914, he was leader of the ACT Party of New Zealand a position he resigned upon failing to be elected to Parliament in the September general election. He has previously worked as a management consultant and as a philosophy lecturer. He is the author of Quack Policy, Free Thoughts, A Load of Blair, and Crimes Against Logic. He won the Bastiat Prize for Journalism in 2006 and was runner-up in 2010 and 2016. We also have Sri Dattriyaji Hosabale, who is a Joint General Secretary of Rashitriya Swayamsevak Sangh, the RSS, 
and he's a very close advisor to the Prime Minister of India, Narada Modi. Dattarayaji is an expert in integral humanism and is also one of the most senior workers in the, of the RSS, a social voluntary organization with some 8 million members and the parent organization of the BJP party. Chairing the uh, month and today, we have Dr. Sachin Ji Nanda, who is the national VM coordinator, and his interests lie in the relationship between political economy, liberty, and the mon monastetic faiths. His postgraduate training has been in, li in liberalism from the University of Nottingham and has studied uh, Islam and Christianity from Oxford. So without further ado, Sachin Ji, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you. So um, thank you for those uh, uh, kind words, Kishan. And uh, let me welcome all of you here to tonight's discussion. Um, you've braved the cold London night on a Friday evening to be here. Can I just say, I'm actually quite delighted that so many have turned up and I'm also quite petrified that so many have turned up because I have to tell you, I, and I, I will apologize before I even begin, that I think most of you are gonna walk away with far more questions than answers. So if you came here looking for some specific solutions to save the world, I'm not sure if this is gonna do it for you, but Richard Munton's perspective and point is to equip us with uh, questions, uh, ideas, uh, a, a bedrock for us to then go and explore. So that is what we're going to try and do today. We're gonna to try and explore the big questions. And of course, tonight's question, as framed, is, is Corbyn's socialism the correct response to the apparent failure of capitalism in modern Britain? Now, or is there a third way and a critical examination of integral humanism? Now, let me caveat that. We, as in the, the speakers here, we will be speaking about what I suppose 100 years ago wouldn't have been called economics at all. It would have been called political economy. And maybe 150 years ago, it would have been called moral philosophy. So we're here to discuss the big questions, the big questions surrounding socialism, surrounding capitalism, and surrounding this potential third way as being experimented in India, integral humanism. So it's the big questions we want to ask, not the necessarily the policy details behind each thing. So I would uh, advise for all of you, as you engage with this discussion, and there'll be plenty of time to ask questions to our, our, our expert witnesses, um, ask the big questions and try and let's try and push them into those big questions and let's get a better understanding of each model and each theory behind it to see which would, would serve us best here in Britain. So we will be using integral humanism as a reflective tool in order to reflect on our circumstances here in Britain. So be aware of that too. Some basic house rules as chair, I'm afraid I have to be the one that, that brings some order uh, to all of this. So I will request all of you when you come to the Q&A to uh, stick to making your statements and questions within one minute. Um, and I will stop you at one minute. Um, so uh, just be aware, aware of that too. Uh, and equally, I will be uh, as strict with uh, our speakers here today as well, who, by the way, have to explain 300 years of capitalism, 300 years of socialism, and, and the whole integral humanism philosophy in 10 minutes each, okay? So, so let's see how well they do. So without further ado, Andrew, do you wanna give us your opening remarks uh, 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 around uh, your position, specifically looking at the question of inequality and the relationship between labor uh, 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 and capital? Thank you, Sachin, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I want to try and make the case for socialism in the 21st century. And I, I start that with uh, a caveat that I'm not here to defend the past. I'm not here to say that socialism as it has been practiced in the past has always succeeded in its variety of forms. And we know that there have been socialist experiments in the UK, but also in Eastern Europe and in developing countries around the world. And I don't really want to engage with the, the, the detail of each of those models, 
whether they succeeded, what their ideals were, and what they looked like in practice. Instead, I want to think about the future and the needs of the 21st century and whether a socialist perspective can help solve them. And we were asked to start off uh, you know, thinking about uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, and his, uh, his major challenge to the British status quo. Um, but I think the first thing to say is that I don't actually know what Jeremy Corbyn really, truly wants himself. Uh, perhaps he doesn't even know, because, I mean, his personal political story has really been defined about his views on foreign policy um, and global conflicts. He's not uh, an established social and economic thinker. But I do know that he wants a big rupture from the way that the British economic system is run today. And I very much endorse that view. Um, I don't necessarily agree with every detail of his policy, but I think the idea that we need a big change in this country is absolutely right. Um, it's a change, though, that we shouldn't see as scary, because it's only scary when you look at it from the perspective of Britain over the last 30 years. If you broaden your lens, and look around the rest of Europe and other developed countries, actually what we're talking about is really joining the mainstream of advanced European economies. What we need is a strong state as well as a successful market economy. And Britain has decided for too long to spend its time emphasizing the economy in the market without the state. We have drifted into the middle of the Atlantic modelling ourselves on America rather than our social democratic European colleagues who are much nearer to home. And I think that's an important message to say we're not necessarily talking about the end of capitalism. We're talking about varieties of capitalism. And I'm sure that's something that colleagues in India and other countries developing very fast can reflect on as well, that there are so many different models of successful economies and many of them have a lot more role for government, the state, uh, than, if you like, the classic American model. I want to start, uh, sort of having set those ground rules up, thinking about what, what does it mean to flourish? What does it mean for humans to flourish? And my argument is that much of what we need to flourish cannot be secured by the market alone, and it certainly cannot be secured equally for us all by the market. And the reason I stress equality is that uh, certainly in the tradition of British socialism since the Second World War, equality is the key. And you can make it, a, a, there have been different strands of socialism over time, but certainly British post-war socialism has been defined by equality as a, as a theme. I should in passing say that very much includes gender inequality, and it's a shame that there aren't uh, women here on the platform tonight. Um, but it also, means equality for everyone in society regardless of their economic background. And the market fundamentally cannot address that sort of, it, uh, of equality because it is, because it, uh, without intervention from a strong state, will always reproduce existing material inequalities. What do we need to flourish them? We need enough money, okay, that's, that's absolutely true. And I don't subscribe to the argument that we don't need to worry about growth anymore. We need access to buy the things we want. But that's just the start. That's the bit that the market can do. But we also need good health and we want to live long lives. And that takes public services in terms of the health, uh, the health system and other public services. It takes regulating away the actions of the market when they cause us illness, be that uh, regulating away you know, the use of tobacco or obesogenic environments that our children see right outside their schools with fast food and trash food. And it also means thinking about equality of power and status because all the academic evidence shows that unequal societies reproduce anxiety and status that then shortens your life. The next thing we need to flourish is skills and knowledge. And we've seen through the development of strong, uh, strong governments over the last 200 years that only government can equip all its citizens equally with the skills they need to thrive, both, um, both instrumentally to lead good economic lives, but also as an intrinsic good in itself. 
We also need a sustainable environment. And again, perhaps more recently, just over the last 20 or 30 years, we have seen that the collective action of governments working together is the only way we can tackle the major environmental challenges this country faces and, and the world faces. In, in international challenges like climate change and local challenges like the crisis of air pollution in, in London can only be tackled by big government. And we also need to flourish to have time and friends and family and loved ones. And time is the start of that. Working lives have been reducing in length for over 100 years. And that's because of the action of government to regulate the labor market so that we can spend more time on the things outside the market that we really value, spending time not just consuming, not just producing, but being. And then the final thing that really does matter is to have a sense of control and power over your own life, your own direction. And of course that does mean having money, but it does mean that you need money uh, in the context of equality. Because otherwise you'll be in a situation where you see others spending things that you can't, and that is not power or freedom or control over your life. So the socialism I'd like to see in the 21st century would be a a movement of equality, a movement that is serious about power for everyone, and a movement that is serious about the collective. For too long in this country, we have allowed an atomized view of society that has focused on individuals as consumers and workers, rather than acknowledging that when we come together, we do our best. But that coming together is not just about the big state, and it's not just about central government, it's about collectivity and solidarity at every level, working together, uh, sometimes national government, sometimes cities, sometimes trade unions who have a vital role in a strong economy, and mutuals and collectives of all sorts that they need to be en enabled. And if we do that, I think we will tackle many of the economic discontents our country faces. We have a dearth of growth in this country. Our economy has been in standstill for 10 years. And that is partly because this public sector has not been investing. It's partly because we've had major cuts, so therefore less, less demand. Um, and that has, that has together meant that we've basically had a standstill. Now, the public sector can't solve all those economic problems, but in the last 10 years, it has been a break rather than an accelerator on growth. We also have spiraling inequality. We have regional inequality, which is actually the real issue that Britain faces. If you want to know one thing that makes us stand out from any other Western developed country, it's our regional inequalities. We also have huge wealth inequalities, spiraling house prices and asset prices for those who have and nothing for those who haven't, or rather, worse than nothing, spiraling debt. And we have a super rich who have been able to lift off from the rest of society. Uh, and that's linked to problems of global capitalism because issues of companies taking their profits elsewhere and people taking uh, the very rich taking their profits elsewhere to tax havens are bound into the problems of the British economy. And then finally, we have short-termism, endemic short-termism, underinvestment by companies, absolutely. Um, damage the environment I've already spoken about, and in our own lives, our inability to plan well, for example, to save enough for our retirements, all of those can be sorted out by the public sector and the state creating frameworks that push us to do the right thing over the long term. So what do I want government to do to be socialist? Provide brilliant world-class public services, invest in the economy, for the long-term future, redistribute so that we have more equality of income and wealth than the market itself would lead, regulate capitalism so that it achieves ends that we all value, and produce collaboration, collaboration between government, between companies working together when it's an important for innovation or the development of new products, and working with trade unions whose bargaining power and collective organization gives workers power and strength to make sure they have a stake in the economy too. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really am going to...
talk about the, the big issues rather than what's going on in Britain today. Um, the, the fundamental problem that humans face is that resources are scarce and humans come into conflict over, over them. Uh, and that's not just conflict over non-human resources, we even come into conflict about what we're going to do with each other. Uh, so for example, you may want uh, a house. Is it? Okay, sorry. You may want to own a house. You may want somebody to build your house. How are you going to get them to do that? Well, because they don't want to do it. Right? It's a lot of work involved. One way you could do it is to pay them, uh, and make them want to do it. But another way you could do it is to threaten to kill them if they don't. Uh, that saves you a lot of money. If you've got a gun, you can get a house for free. Uh, and this is been the history of humanity. People have enslaved each other, they've threatened each other, they've killed, they've raped, they've robbed. It's a bad scene. Now, there's a remedy, which is one argument for the state, which is that you get an organization that has a monopoly on force, has enough force to stop individuals using force against each other, and then we're all better off. And we live in a society where you can't get things by force, you've got to get them voluntarily. You've got to induce people to want to interact with you in the way that you would like. Uh, that's, that's the argument, that's an argument for having a state, but it's also an argument for having a very limited state. Because in this conception of the role of the state, all the state really does is to protect you from other people's coercion. It doesn't get involved in the business of coercing you for some other purpose. Right? Because if it did, it would just be a vehicle for the very problem it's supposed to be solving. If somebody could lobby the government to force me to build them a house, it's not that different from them coming up to, with the gun themselves and forcing me to build the house. So this is the basic idea, the liberal conception of the state. It should, be a, it should prevent people from using force and it should not itself use force except for that purpose. A limited government. Now. Uh, this gives you what a lot of people lament, that it, they, they say it's an individualistic society once you have that going on, and so it is, in the sense that each individual gets to choose how they live, who they interact with, what they do, what they buy, and so on. And if you extend this notion to economic matters, you get a free market. Uh, most importantly, you get freedom of contract. So you can enter into whatever economic arrangements you like with people, you can form whatever contracts, so to speak, you want to enter into employment, rental, you name it. Now the government's role in the economy on this view is to perhaps to enforce those contracts, right? because if you don't honor your contracts in a certain sense you're tricking people, you're kind of using force against them. So the state may enforce the contracts, but it doesn't set the terms of the contracts. It doesn't say what must be in the contracts. That's between you, that's between free individuals. So that's individualism, but it's important to note no, well, first I want to make a point about why it works so well, why it produces wealth and prosperity. And the reason is that when the government won't act on your, on your behalf, won't act as your agent and give you things that it's taken from others, you must, for yourself, find out ways to please other people. I can only get ahead in a market economy if I offer something that other people value. In my labor, I might offer, you know, I might train myself so that I'm useful and then people will hire me and pay me more money. But if I'm, if I'm no use, nobody's going to hire me. Uh, so I always attend to other people's preferences. It, a free market is actually a very a highly social uh, phenomenon because I've, I can only advance my own interests by thinking about what other people want. The ultra-rich in our society today are people who have, on the whole, are people who have come up with brilliant new ways of providing people with things that they value. Now, it's important to note that it isn't an individualistic conception of society. I mean, th th this, a free market society is not individualistic in the sense that everybody's selfish, because of course people care about each other. I care about my family, I care about my friends, to a lesser extent I care about my neighbors, I don't really care at all about strangers, if I'm honest. Uh, people, remote people who I've never met living in distant parts of the world, if I hear that they've died in a volcano, I think that's sad in some abstract sense. But to be honest, I don't cry, I don't lose any sleep. 
and I doubt that I'm exceptional in this regard. But n nonetheless, people do care about each other. And interestingly, during the most free market period in history, which for the United Kingdom and the United States was the, 19th, the second half of the 19th century and up to World War I, you saw a flourishing of societies. Look, you had uh, churches thrived, cl sports clubs were beginning, uh, all sorts of charitable societies began, and friendly societies, which were kind of mutual insurance schemes for people. All of these cropped up during that period of free market capitalism, and they're all voluntary associations. Since the advent of the welfare state, the, they have been crowded out. So if the government promises to pay you unemployment insurance, if it pay you an unemployment benefit if you become unemployed, and it's funded from taxation, why, why bother joining a friendly society where you make voluntary uh, payments into it? Uh, and you can see that as the welfare state has built up, all of the voluntary and private institutions that used to play the role of redistributing wealth or providing social insurance have been crowded out, as economists put it, and they've faded away. Indeed, even the family is being crowded out by the state. One of the family's functions as a social institution is to support its members. One reason you don't want to piss off your relatives is because one day when you're in trouble, you might need their help. Nowadays, you don't need their help because the state will come in and help you. The state is kind of your parent. And so you don't need to worry so much about maintaining family relationships or even families at all. And we have seen a great expansion in single parenthood and a, uh, a reduction in the size of families. So the idea that free market capitalism is kind of anti-social and state socialism is highly social gets it completely the wrong way around. The welfare, it should be called the anti-social uh, uh, it should be called the anti-social welfare because it stops us actually attending to each other. Uh, I, I want to just say one final thing about uh, this desire uh, often expressed that we have uh, top-class public services, as it's put. Well, it would be a nice idea, but why should it happen? Just take the example of a school. Suppose you, you start a private school. What's your big problem? Well, it's attracting students willing to pay the fees. So you have to offer an education that they value at least as high, or the parents value at least as high as, as the fees. Forces you to do a good job, at least by the lights of the parents. Now suppose you run a state school. You get the money from, from the government. You get it from taxpayers who have no choice in the matter. They get put in prison if they don't hand the money over. The students have got really more or less no choice in which school they attend because their parents have been taxed. They can't afford a private school at 20,000 pounds. Do you need to do a good job? Well, you've got no incentive to do a good job except the kindness of your heart. But a system that relies on the kindness of hearts uh, isn't a great system. I prefer a system in which, I can, uh, in which people benefit themselves by benefiting others. So we have seen... Uh, a great expansion of the state over the course of the 20th century. And we have seen enormous dissatisfaction with what the state supplies. And the answer, oh, we should just do it better, is kind of ridiculous because there is no reason to assume that it ever can be done better because the basic economic structures and incentives are completely wrong. So I think the remedy to the problems that Britain faces today is a great liberalization of our society, great reduction in the size and role of the state so that people can start uh, looking after each other. And they look each, uh, it's still looking after each other even if you have a commercial incentive to do it. Just to, we're going to take a slight detour for tonight's program because uh, we've been honoured to have the uh, High, High Commissioner uh, uh, come over. We wanted to get, uh, get him to say a few words before the event but he's just arrived and I think he has to run back off. So. And, and, and introduce the, the, the High Commissioner. Um, His, His Excellency Mr. Sinha is a, a seasoned diplomat and uh, during a career spanning over 36 years, he has handled several important assignments at the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi and in, uh, in Indian diplomatic missions in South Asia, the Middle East, Europe and South America. So um, I'd like to come, uh, grant you uh, the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. 
नमस्कार थैंक यू एंड गुड इवनिंग दाता राय साबले जी इट्स अ प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू हियर ऑल योर एमिनेंट पैनलिस्ट फॉर दिस विचार मंथन माय सिंसियर अपॉलॉजीज आई हैव नॉट द मास्टर ऑफ माय टाइम टुडे आई हैड द ऑनरस टास्क ऑफ इंश्योरिंग दैट इंडिया इज री इलेक्टेड टू द काउंसिल ऑफ द इंटरनेशनल मैरिटाइम ऑर्गेनाइजेशन and i am happy to inform you that we won with the second largest number of votes uh, 144 votes out of 162 and uh, um and and after that i had a function with the british indian councillors at an initiative that i had taken when i came here a year ago and we had a second meeting this year uh, we've been trying to connect uh, with uh, the indian diaspora at various fora uh, various levels uh, whether it's uh, regional groups people from different states of india who live in the uk or professional organizations and i think this outreach to the british indian councillors is important because you know that they are uh, the grassroots in, in a democracy uh, grassroots politicians so i'm very happy that this initiative in fact is still i i was uh, upstairs and i came with a panel discussion going on so i excused myself and came here but i'm delighted to welcome all of you to the to india house for this very interesting uh, discussion uh, i recall that uh, pandit din dayal upadhyay ji's anniversary we had a, a, a function where we discussed integral humanism and the great contribution that he has made to the thought process of india i'm not just india but outside but certainly in india has made us reevaluate what we were as a colonial Uh, as a colony and uh, after independence the direction that we have taken and i don't want to comment on which systems are better marxist socialism or capitalism but all i can say is that this integral humanism that he propounded was basically something that reflected the desire of the common man the, the aspirations of the common man uh, you know the evils or or the the misfortunes in any system whether it's political or economic uh need to be addressed and he sought to address that by going back to your roots which i think is extremely important because our roots in india are very ancient when we talk about the collective wisdom of india we go back thousands of years whether it's the upanishads or the vedas or the purans we have and of course the bhagavad gita which is the seminal work uh in 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 any thought in any ideology so i think uh this highlighting this is something that is very important especially abroad and i'm uh, very grateful that apart from the efforts that the high commission makes there are various organizations of the diaspora here uh that come and 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 spread the the good word if so to speak because i think it's important that we recognize who we are not just the diaspora but even those of us who live in india uh need to understand recognize because we've forgotten and the reason why we've forgotten is because we've been under uh, foreign rule if i may put it that way for so long and independent india since 1947 has been trying to find its moorings and there are debates which are very good but i think it's important to remember our past and not just live in the past but learn from the past and imbibe the qualities that our ancestors have taught us through the ages and i think this is where uh, discussions like this are very important and this is where we feel that the diaspora should play a very important role in uh, we're speaking about the uk and we are very happy that we have such eminent people like uh, dataray husable ji who has come from india to 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 talk to us uh, about integral humanism about human values and about what our scriptures and what our ancestors that fund of knowledge that they have left with us i do apologize for interrupting this panel discussion uh, i i really uh, sh- shouldn't have uh, accepted to have so many functions in the day but that's the job of a high commissioner you should understand but i'm delighted that all of you have come in such large numbers to participate in this function with these words i'd like to seek your indulgence and your leave but i have to get back to that function upstairs but i'd like to wish all of you a very good evening and very fruitful discussions thank you 
So very quickly, um, we shall uh, move on to our third speaker, Dataji Hasbale, on integral humanism. We have heard now about socialism and the capitalist view of the economy. Integral humanism, as propounded by Dindal Upadhyaya, a political thinker and activist and a, an office bearer of a political party, totally differs from these worldviews and political ideologies. What constitutes the core philosophy of integral humanism as propounded by Dean Dalupadji is liberating humanity from these binary ideologies, perspectives and actions. It is either socialism or capitalism. So the world was divided into these two blocks for long as we know. So this uh, binary of ideologies is not the panacea. Mr. Shupadhyaya considered binary as creating deficit in creative thinking and institutionalization of irrationalities. Its best example is this rejection of left-right divide or the socialism-capitalism divide because this divide itself is illogical and untenable. There are many issues which both groups share. Even while these two gentlemen were uh, expressing, we have considered those areas where they share it. Therefore, such divisions prevent evolution of ideas and uh, pro-people holistic perspective that has been the consideration of Dindal Upadhyaya, the proponent of this political philosophy. He was the first to say so, but the European thinkers now believe the same. Now, how it is uh, impacting the economic creed of individual? Integral humanism That way the original term is Ekatma Manav Darshan. It is translated into English. Coming from India, I will have to inform you that the translation fully, it, it doesn't fully uh, connote the innermost meaning of these terms because such terms are the products of a civilizational value system and world view. Because if you have to understand the various terms, then you will have to understand the civilizational background and the terminologies that have been used by various texts on which the nation's conscience have been built. However, in the absence of a better term, integral humanism has been used. Integral humanism considers human beings central role in transforming society, the centrality of the human being. Because generally these two ideologies which have ruled the last 200 years of human society in political sphere and economic sphere, they have confined themselves to the economic aspect of entire life and the role of the state, production, distribution, consumption and ownership of wealth. Only these things are not going to constitute a political philosophy. But that has been the experience when the socialism and our capitalism or the free enterprise or laissez fair as they call, when these have been uh, implemented. Therefore, the integral humanism 
begins with the man's role as a basic unit of both family and society. The individual or human being has multiple layers of relationships, responsibilities and is influenced by multiple forces. Individuals is not influenced by own, not only by the state policies or the economic market forces. There are many other areas and other influences that do have their impact on individuals and society. It is for these reasons that individualism is anathema to integral humanism. Dindalji diverts and delivers and uh, dictates for causes which leads to constructive denial to him. Th that is constructive denial is the way that uh, sacrifice has been explained in Hindu value system. A person who has something in possession will be denying to enjoy that and that is called Tyaga. So possession of wealth and creation of wealth and utilizing, implementing or consuming it, that becomes the core of economic philosophies. But here is a philosophy which emphasizes on the constructive denial. These constructive denials according to the even Western utilitarian, uh, utilitarians like Bentham and J.S. Mill, lesser is pleasure. But according to Deen Dayal Upadhyayaji's philosophy, it satisfies his inner core and therefore gives him ultimate satisfaction. As just so Mr. White was uh, mentioning that brothers can help mutually. Integral humanism completely negates utilitarian thoughts. The resources are in my possession, but not mine. It leads a man to preserve it for posterity and accumulation of possession for society rather than for his own material pleasure. Materialism is being curbed and controlled by spiritual inclination and social concerns. How integral humanism is different from communism and capitalism? This philosophy is based on two assumptions. One, there are multiple forces which stop one force to establish its hegemony on man's mind, heart, spiritual, social, individual, economic, cultural aspects of the personality. They constitute layers of, here I will use the Sanskrit term because the propounder of this philosophy has used those terms, that is artha, kama and dharma, that is the desires of the human being is called kama. The desires of physical desires. material desires. The artha is resources to satiate those desires by nature, through nature, through state arrangements, society systems. So the artha constitutes all these things. And the dharma, that is the third aspect, which is the universal ethical order that governs both artha and kama. That is the desires, material, physical desires of the human being yep. and on the other side, the social systems, systems of governance, market forces, these things have to be governed by some ethical order. That ethical order is called dharma. And human being has to be viewed in 
integral way, holistic way. The political and economic philosophies for the last 200 years all over the world have taken into consideration only the material or the physical aspect of the human being. But man is consisting of body, mind, intellect and the spirit. Unless and until the full and balanced growth and development of all these four aspects of the human being have been achieved, that political or economic philosophy has done only one-fourth of the work. So this is what integral humanism says. Second, man's relation is with three other relations, man and man. An individual with another individual. Individual with the collective, that is society, community. And the man's or the individual's relation with nature. Because all our resources are coming from nature. Today the environmentalists are speaking about these things, how we use, utilize our resources, about climate change, which Andrew was mentioning. And the fourth is, man, each individual has a, he, he, he thinks of a relation between himself and the creator. So these four relations, that is cosmos, that is the higher um, noble forces, and these things have to be taken into consideration while thinking of political economic philosophies. The third and more important thing is, that is Dharma, Rashtra, Chiti and Virat. These are the four very basic principles of integral humanism. Dharma already explained, tried to explain, that is universal ethical order that should govern all aspects of our life. Second, the Rashtra is a unit, nation or the country, unless and until you experiment this at one level, you cannot implement this for the entire humanity. Because, as I have said, the integral humanism considers that there cannot be one straight jacket philosophy for all sections of the humanity all over the world. Local things will have to be taken into consideration. So this is what, uh, in essence, the integral humanism means. So that's three huge political ideas all in 30 minutes. Well done. Very well done. Um, and, and, and I can imagine some of those points that came out. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a, a little mountain ourselves. And you can eavesdrop. And then once we've started to ask some of these questions to each other, um, you will be able to join in. So this is the time to start thinking about some of your questions that you may want to pose uh, uh, any of our expert witnesses. So I've got a question just to kind of get things going. Um, and I'm going to address a question to each of you uh, uh, in turn. And, and Andrew, since you went first, I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, in a nutshell, Andrew, I, I accept wholeheartedly that the idea of welfare, that is helping those who are, uh, um, require help to get on in life, is a very noble act. I totally accept that. I, I totally admire the entire, entire thrust of that. But there is one thing, and I'm going to use a, um, Milton Friedman's argument, and, and, and this thing that he seems to um, uh, uh, argue with rather better than what I will do today. But let me give it a go with what I think Milton Friedman's problem with this is. He argues that isn't it always the case that the individual who has earned his money is always going to be more careful with his money than some big brother state, number one. And number two, ultimately locked into the very idea of what you suggested is coercion, which Jamie touched on, but I want to push it a little bit further. Isn't it effectively you're saying that equality ought to come 
at the cost of liberty. Because liberty and equality aren't always best friends. And you seem to be suggesting that equality is the, the hallmark of civilization and at the cost of liberty because coercion is inevitably structured into what you are proposing. Just your thoughts on that. Um, of course, the claim that we should be as equal as possible and treated with equal dignity is an ethical claim. It's not, you know, it, it is about you know, a view of society rather than a material truth. But I think there's an awful lot of the same you know, ethical claim implied in a capitalist libertarian view, which is basically the primacy of property over everything else. Um, you say that a egalitarian socialist view of the world um, is uh, intrusive on liberty, but actually, when I, mean, I used the word earlier, power rather than liberty, although they're close to each other, because I think it exposes that you know, power is about the practical ability to have control over your life in a way that's meaningful to you. And that is partly about your, in, your, your abilities and capabilities, but it is also about the constraints upon you, around you. And that sometimes those constraints can be improved by getting things out of the way, but sometimes they can be improved by the support that you are given by others, including government. So that government endowing you with ability to do things gives you power and a socialist government, I'm gonna stop, sure. and a socialist government believes in equality of power so that it, it is about leveling up and not just the very poor, but it's about endowing everyone. And the best example of this is excellent education. Sure, but is there, let me just push a little bit further. Is there something to be said about the fact that yes, it's power for all, but the state has the most power uh, in order so that others have equal power. So you've still got this um, big brother in whose name we trust our lives to and our welfares to rather than our own individual uh, impetus, drives, competencies, determination, etc. But the other question, just quickly to touch on, was this notion of efficiency, and efficient is a bad word, but this notion, basic idea, this caricature that Friedman does, which is, look, I'm always going to be more careful with my money and how I spend it, and I'll make sure my money goes f as far as it can, rather than me giving my money forcefully to Jamie, and Jamie spends that money for me, or for us all. So is there something to be said about that? So if you look at you know, large economies, uh, there's no relationship in terms of the success of large uh, economies between the size of their states within, within the range of advanced economies. So you know, France spends about 50% of GDP uh, on the public sector. America is more like 25%. Uh, but over the long run, looking at different uh, economies, the living standards of families in them have not been correlated with the size of their, their government. And actually, if you look at America over the last 30 or 40 years, male earnings at the middle have not increased after you take inflation into account. There is something utterly broken with the American economic model. And that, I'm afraid, explains Donald Trump. I'd like just to say something about power and uh, liberty. Uh, in the system that I outlined to you, nobody has any power in the sense that I, they can't coerce anybody else. That's the whole idea. The whole idea of the liberal system is to remove power from it. Now, many people, particularly on the left, like to uh, say that abilities are power. Uh, they're not really. I mean, for example, some people can, uh, I can buy um, if I've got a lot more money, I can buy more stuff than you can. That doesn't mean I have power because I can't force anybody to sell me anything. I, I can't force any, anything. Uh, I, an analogy, it's a bit risky that I use. I'm going to try it out here. Uh, suppose you're very beautiful. Uh, then you have what we colloquially call pulling power. Right? But when you do seduce somebody, you haven't coerced them. It's not really power in, in the literal political sense. And there's a persistent muddying of the waters, mixing up of the notion of power, proper power, which means you can use force against people, and abilities, which are not a kind of power at all. So we're going to definitely dig into that, Andrew, so you'll get your chance to, to, to come back on that too. Um, 
but Jamie, let me let me then come 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 to to some of the ideas that that you you had. You seem to be suggesting, and you mentioned liberty. So here it's the other way around. You seem to be suggesting that liberty um, will somehow bring equality in our society, uh, or or, or m m maybe not equality, but but at least it will be a better a, a better state of affairs. Um, isn't it such that the free market inherently leads to inequality, greater inequality, and effectively two things occur. One is concentration of wealth at the top with the, with, with the capitalists, those who control the resources. And number two, that actually it's unsustainable anyway. You're kind of always duped into large booms and busts because the top 1%, when, they, when you centralize all this wealth, don't really, uh, they, the, what, the, the rich can't always sustain any economy. The, mid, the middle class do. So at some point when inequality gets too high, you always fall at some point. So there's some, there seem to be some, some structural problems in what you're saying. Could you respond to that? Well, the first thing I'll say is that yes, free, free markets, liberty does lead to inequality. In fact, it doesn't just lead to it. It's a very important part of it. For example, you couldn't have a functioning labor market if people all earned the same pay. I mean, suppose, for example, that a brain surgeon, a brain surgeon earned the same as a toilet cleaner. Why would anybody spend, borrow thousands of pounds to get their medical degree, go to university, spend all that time, do, go through all the pain of becoming a doctor simply to earn the same as a toilet cleaner. Uh, and indeed, pay is simply a price in the labor market. So labor markets cannot function without different levels of pay. Uh, if, if, if the fact that my skills were in short supply and there was a lot of demand to them didn't lead to me getting higher pay, the labor market wouldn't work. And so, Inequality is actually vital to the functioning of a successful society. Now, whether but or not... But you'd argue there are some limits, some structures there. Or, 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 or is there no limits? Is, is it that inequality can just well, keep on going, I, in I, which I, case... Let me try to answer. I mean, there, there are great debates about the extent to which uh, capitalism does lead to concentrations of capital. Um, there's a recent book out by Piketty which suggests that it inherently does. It's been criticised. I don't think we can quite get into that here, but I want to make a slightly broader point, which is that as people get richer, as everybody gets richer, and this is what's happening in the world at the moment, differences in apparent wealth matter less. Uh, if you are earning $1,000 a year, you're an abject, that's terrible, you're really, really poor, you probably have a dirt floor. You get another $1,000 a year, that makes a very big difference to your life. Now, suppose you're a billionaire. Suppose, and you get another 100 million. It doesn't change your life at all. This is known as the diminishing marginal value of money. You're, and so as we all get richer, differences in wealth start to mean less. I mean, nobody cares about the difference between Vladimir Putin's wealth and George Soros's wealth. And it, though it sounds odd, that, that's kind, that, that is kind of happening at a global level. So as everybody gets more and more money, if it once, suppose, and soon, at the rate we're going, everybody, the average world income will be something like $100,000 a year in today's money. I'm, I'm not making this up. At that point, do we, do we care about inequality? Of course, there's two things. One is that seems to fly completely uh, in the face of what Andrew had mentioned about the, the, the stagnating uh, wages. I just want to bring in, uh, 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 did you have any questions for, for Jamie or Andrew at this stage? And then, Andrew, you can respond. But however, the experience of Latin American pink wave revolutions uh, and the socialist things, they have not been successful. The, you, you mentioned that uh, socialist philosophy. So whether such experiments in uh, European countries are going to be successful. Um, Andrew, do you want to come back on some of the things Jamie said? And I'm picking up the point you're both making, and I think it's the most serious challenge to socialism, is uh, the big states being run in the interests of elites rather than of the people. And that's why, I mean, the, the ethical core of socialism has to be genuinely empowering everyone. And where that stops being the role that a government is playing, it's not being true to its own values. And I agree, historically, there are lots of examples of that being the case. And that's why, I mean, I'm saying that the UK should be more like successful 
European social democracies which are uh, more effective at mixing the state and the market. I'm not arguing for state socialism, I'm not arguing for a Latin American model which really hasn't fulfilled its own ambitions. Okay, so, so there's still that, and this is something for you, maybe you, all of you to pick up on rather than me, but it's that notion of how big is big enough? How unequal is inequality enough? There is that question, and then we can leave that now. But I want to come to uh, uh, Dataji, if I may uh, call you that as a friend. Um, you, 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 and, and thank you for that, because you did a good job there in 10 minutes of outlining the underlying, and I think you were trying to show a, the difference in underpinning, if I can say it that way, with integral humanism compared to maybe what, how Adam Smith or, or, or Rousseau you know, in the 18th century would have started thinking about their ideas. And, and in fact, that was moral philosophy. And what we're discussing here is almost a form of moral philosophy, philosophy creeping into political economy. In the same way then, let me take your moral philosophy that you outlined and bring you a little bit into the political realm, a little bit, where I want to know, you mentioned some really powerful points. And, and if I may use your words, um, so just bear with me so I can find the exact words you used. You mentioned a, a, a concept that I think we in the West, at least me, I've never quite grasped until you said it, which was um, a constructive denialism. A constructive de denialism is what you used. So my question then is to what end, um, I've lost myself now, I am. Oh, yes. to, to what end then does integral humanism go in? I assume it. Ex I assume it accepts some role for the market. I assume it rolls. It, it, it accepts the fact that price is best determined by the market. I, I, I suppose. I also suppose that it accepts that the state uh, has a certain responsibility in helping, aiding, or curbing certain human tendencies. But could you just elaborate on that relationship? So then we can, um, I suppose, easily contrast it as well with what some of the other speakers have said. So could you just bring, it, bring that in? Tell us a little bit about the relationship between how in an integral humanistic society, which is still an idea, mind you. It's still an idea. I mean, India is still experimenting, and India is still, I suppose, uh, at a formative stage. So, but, but how do you envisage it? Of course, in the modern economy and political uh, situation, the integral humanism is still an idea or a philosophical level. But uh, as a nation, as a civilization, India has experimented it for hundreds of years. That's also true. Because before the advent of industrialization, so in the modern times, as you said, it is still an idea. And the present government is trying to implement in its own way. In bits and pieces, not wholly as of now because the opportunity was very less now. Now having said this, I you think is a constructive denial and uh, things. As I said, the values of dharma that when counts the values Yeah. It's okay now. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. The uh, uh, about constructive denial. That is, uh, of course, Ms. Uh, Jimmy has uh, referred to that in his, uh, while he was referring to the role of uh, the brother in a family. You, you, you mentioned it. So why a person should do that? That is. The human values have to be inculcated even in order to see that economy succeeds and the government's function, the human values have to be taken into consideration. What happens in a political philosophy and economic philosophy that have been uh, uh, all these years practiced in the West and uh, elsewhere in the world have not taken into consideration the human emotions, values, cultural systems, etc. 
So that's why Bhutan has experimented now the gross national happiness, GNH. That is the uh, measuring rod now that they have made it. There, apart from economic factors, various other social, cultural factors are also taken into consideration for the betterment of the upliftment of the society, even economically. So these things are required. Now the role of state and the market. Integral humanism do doesn't deny the role of uh, state and the market. They, they have their role, they are very significant role. The denial of state or the denial of market, both. These things are, are extreme views. The state has no role, one ideology can say. The market all should be totally regulated or controlled, the another ideology can say. But the integral humanism says there has to be a mutuality. The regulating authority will have to be there. But also there has to be a space for the people to freely function in a free economy. So that's why there has to be a wonderful mix. Integral humanism blends economy <coughs> and spiritual values. That is the beauty of it. So can I just, just push a little bit further? So I think we would all accept that the market has a role and the state has a role. I think we would all accept that. Jamie would probably say the state should be very, very small. And, and, and Andrew would argue that the state has to be a little bit bigger. So that's fine. That's it. Where would, and I know it's hard to say, but, but do you generally, um, would you put your trust generally in a larger state or a smaller state? a more liberal society or a more regulated society or do you see it as a journey where you may start off being regulated and you become deregulated or vice versa? I don't say whether it should be a larger state or a smaller state. It should be a humane state. And, and, and describe that a little. I'm going to push it a little bit further so we can. So when you say humane state, you are implying that the state here is not humane. So can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, that has been the experience all these years. Because when the socialist experiment has been many a time totalitarian and authoritative, coercive. And in the capitalist system, it has been exploitative and anti-environment. I, I just want to point out something about, I think, a misconception about uh, free market capitalism. I mean, the word capitalism is what's doing the problem, is the problem. Capitalism isn't really an economic system at all, it's just what happens when people have freedom of contract. But the, the important point I want to make out is there's nothing intrinsically materialistic about it. So it may be that I care more about leisure or more about um, having a... Yeah, I'm holding it down because it avoids the buzz. Okay, so I'll speak louder. Uh, I, I may have quite interest, my values may be spiritual. And if I'm a spiritual person living in a free market capitalist society, I can forego, let's say, some income for the sake of leading a more peaceful spiritual life. I can choose to do that, and many people do choose to do that. Uh, you'll see that as societies become richer, they start taking more leisure time, they start devoting more of their energies to things that they that give their lives uh, enrichment and fulfillment rather than just struggling to get a potato out of the ground. And, and so there's nothing anti-spiritual about a, a very free society. Crucially, and this is where the difference comes, I think, between my kind of philosophy and almost all others. When, on a socialist society, the state has to take a view about what matters in life because it's going to arrange things so that there's more of the stuff that matters and less of the stuff that doesn't matter. For example, you mentioned smoking. Some people like to smoke and they're willing to forego their health for the sake of the smoking. Politicians in Britain say, oh, no, no, they're making the wrong decision. We must use coercive state power to change their behavior so that they live the right way. But that requires politicians to believe themselves to know what the right way to live is. And I think that's kind of outrageous. I'm really glad Jamie went down that train because I wanted to uh, say something similar, which is that you know the left quite explicitly has a view of what a good society should be, 
uh, and there are lots of different views, but you know, by design, it is trying to change society for the better. And I've already mentioned a few examples. For example, uh, tackling climate change, ensuring that we have enough time in our lives away from work for family. Um, but we could go on. We could, um, you know, think about all the things that each of us individually want. Uh, how we want society to be better. I mean, I've talked about equality as well. Where that is not coercion is where we do it democratically. So the importance, we haven't really talked about democracy yet. If this is imposed by a state without democratic mechanisms, and I mean formal democracy, but I also mean the process of political dialogue in, in every sense, so that, it, uh, so, that the, so that the decisions that are made are made as a result of debate across society. You can't just say it's the imposition of one view over another. And I think that if you don't have a governing, a, a governing system that has views on ends rather than just has rules about how you conduct yourself, then you get to a very dangerous place. And you know, the best example is climate change, where we allowed the economy just to develop in its own direction without even realizing or caring that we were endangering our planet. Thank you for that. That's interesting. Um, in fact, for a minute there, I thought we we're going to just have one mic between us, and then we we're going to be in real trouble. I'll talk, talk about scarce resources then. Um, <laughs> um, just, just to, I suppose this question for all of you, and maybe we can all jump in. Democracy. You brought democracy up. <clears throat> Let me be a cynic. If socialists, if the socialist trajectory requires a strong democracy, and you, quite honestly, said that a socialist agenda has a clear idea of what a good society ought to entail. I mean, you can vary about the methodology, as you mentioned. But to develop a democracy by its very nature, and if we talk about a liberal democracy, where the individual doesn't just turn up once every five years and think, hmm, which man or woman do I like the most? Who wears the best dresses? You know, who... who uses language that makes me feel safe. If that is the level of our democracy, then let me be a cynic and say, the only alternative you would have is then to kind of just creep and say, well, the masses don't really know what's good for them. They don't really know what's right for them. They don't really get it. So slowly, slowly, you, you, it, it, it's, the, it's the short end of the, of the wedge, the sharp end of the wedge before you start imposing uh, uh, upon the people because the people as a mass can be can be, and we've seen it throughout history, uh, you know, um, I dare not bring in this, the election in the States, but you see my point. The humanity has an ability to bring in the most ridiculous type of leaders, uh, and therefore wouldn't, the, wouldn't you naturally want to creep into that? I, I'd argue that the precise opposite is what's happened over the last 30 years or so, that we've had a creeping uh, development of neoliberal economics without the public ever really being sold it, you know, explained uh, what the implications were, you know, the, the inequality that has grown uh, in our market without there being a legitimate public debate, uh, concentrations of power, you know, in you know, the media, in links into government, um, and in just spending power, mean that, you know, the takeover has not been from uh, a hostile central state doing things against democratic wishes. It's been about uh, the growing concentration of power of economic elites who are ever more distant from the lives of, not, I'm not just talking about the poor, I'm talking about pretty much everyone. You know, 90 or 95% of the country is so far removed from the economic power of those right at the top and often pulling levers from outside the country. You know, power exercised uh, by people who have put their money elsewhere. Um. Jamie, do, do, do you have anything to question uh, the Tajiji the, the on this side? Do you have any questions for either of the... Uh, Anti-democracy point, this should be fun. Yeah. Uh, democracy is a perfectly... Well, first I want to point out that when... <coughs> if 51% of the population agreed to imprison the other 49% of the population, the other 49% of the population really are being coerced. It doesn't, the coercion doesn't go away just because 51% of the population like the idea. And so the question is which, which things should be decided collectively and which things should be decided individually. So I think everybody in the room would think it peculiar to have a vote 
about what colour socks I should wear. I, I can be left to make my own decision about what kind of socks I should wear because it affects me, it doesn't really harm you. It's, some decisions maybe do need to be uh, made centrally. Uh, some, some decisions perhaps do need to be made collectively. Um, how much should we spend on the military? Uh, because you know we all put in the money there for a, a pooled resource, the military defends us all, so maybe that's a collective decision. And what's happened under a basic, the growth of the state is that more and more things that really could just be left to individuals are being made matters of collective decision making. So for example, whether or not I smoke. Whether or not I smoke is surely my problem. Right? Uh, and, uh, but it's been taken out of my hands because we have elected governments which have a that prioritize health over stimulation. If I prioritize stimulation over health, that's tough luck for me. I've got to go along with the democratic will. So democracy does involve coercion, and we've got far too many decisions being made democratically that don't need to be made de democratically. So can, can I just uh, come back to, to you? The, the mic seems to be working, right? You can all hear it. So it's just you then, Jamie. For some reason, this mic does not like you. But It's a but socialist it, mic. It, it's a socialist mic. <laughs> Let me just come back to you then. So you, you, you talk about democracy and, and sort of its, its limitations. I accept them principally. But you're actually suggesting two things here, and I want to make it clear to the audience and correct me if I'm wrong in my clarification. Effectively, he's suggesting two things this, this evening. One, in a capitalist free market society, inequality is what you have to live with, right? And what should drive your progression is your own competency, ability, hard work, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to caveat that in a minute. Number two, though, is that democracy itself should be curbed and limited to, as Jamie said, where it belongs. So now democracy has a specific uh, uh, world, a, a specific place in our society. It is not all ruling. Again, something that on the whole, I would agree that it has its limitations, it has its place. But let me push a little bit back on what you've said, which is that, okay, so, so, so let's test Jamie here. You must be against inheritance tax of all kinds. Well, I'm not quite, I am as a matter of fact, but I'm not quite sure what that's got to do with democracy. I'll tell you why. It's got to be inequality, because uh, one of the biggest challenges to free markets is that when we talk about one's individual's own competency or one's own uh, spirit or dynamism, whatever, that has an underlying prerequisite, which is that we all have equal grounds to begin with. And so as soon as I have a father that's given me a billion dollars to play with, and the other person's father has given him $10 to play with, even though he is far more talented than I, I have all the networks, the money, the clout, and that is real power. And therefore, for the, for the person who has $10, the state becomes a real critical player, I would argue, uh, to level the playing field, to give a real challenge, a real meritocracy. Um, well, first let me say that I don't, for a minute, I, I, I don't believe in meritocracy. I don't believe that a capitalist society is a meritocracy. And I also don't think that we should have a meritocracy. Because uh, in a meritocracy, somebody has to decide what counts as merit and reward it. Uh, in, a, in a free market, people get, they do deals with each other, they trade, they do this, that. There's no judgment about whether you deserve. Uh, and I don't for a second believe that people who get rich deserve it or are morally superior. And of course, an enormous amount of, of your success in life is due to good fortune. The good fortune to have the parents you had, the circumstances you were born into. So my, my defense of, of this free market system isn't that it's fair in a cosmic sense of fairness. It, Excellent. It's not so, at all. So, so let me just say, you have got three incredibly interesting views here for you to now question, which is, on this side you have Andrew, who, who, who unequivocally said, the state, sorry, the left have a particular view of the good society. You have Jamie, who said the exact diametric opposite, where actually your values are your values. There are no cosmic values. It's a very postmodern sort of thought, where you, you project your own values, and, and kind of we, we, as long as you're not harming anyone else, we let you get on with it. If you want to smoke, you want to take drugs, go for it. Don't harm anyone else. 
So you've got two very, very diametrically opposite views about values that, that drive a society, or not values that drive a society. And then on this side, you've got the, 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 the Datoji who mentioned the, the, the notion of integral humanism. And again, here, there are some very, very specific values uh, uh, upon which a society should be built, which are, of course, very, very different to the values that Andrew, or maybe not very, very different, but certainly different values to maybe what Andrew was, was talking about. So you've got three things here to explore. Furthermore, talk about power. You have Andrew, who says a strong democracy is good uh, 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 for a socialist agenda because it curbs the power of the state and actually you will get some sort of harmony and balance. You have Jamie who says actually you know, democracy needs to be put in place and not be relied upon. Um, and what would you like to say about democracy? Decentralization and democracy are the pillars of integral humanism philosophy. Can you explain? Yeah. In democracy, the... So, and you said decentralization. Yeah. That is, the in, integral humanism encourages federalism of locals, traditions and patterns. So democratic way of life has to be encouraged. Democracy is not only a political system, but it has to be encouraged at all walks of life in the way that the, 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 the demo, democracy is to exercise one's uh, ability to perform for the betterment of the society. So for that, whether the space is given or not, many a time in both socialist and capitalist uh, system, this has been denied. So that's why integral humanism uh, believes in the total democracy of the individuals and various systems and patterns and traditions in the society apart from the governmental systems. The society also has to enjoy that democracy because social systems uh, do play a very important role even in the economic functioning of the society. Right, wonderful. Can you all hear me? Yeah, perfect. So, so now you've, we've st we'll stop our month and we're going to bring you into this. So um, do we have some mic, mic runners? Um, now, remember the house rules, your question or statement within one minute. Um, please tell us your name. Um, and if you are from an organization, please confess. Um, if you're not, don't worry, just tell us your name. And, and, and if you have a question that's particularly uh, addressed at any of our expert witnesses, please tell us who you're addressing it to. Um, and if it's for everybody, then it's for everybody. And we'll make sure they all answer. Um, but if, you're, if I find that your question is too long, too windy, or I've not understood it, I'm going to rephrase it in my own framework. So there's the caveat. So keep it simple for me, okay? So I have to be able to understand it. Uh, what we're going to do is if I can get three questions at a time. So, so um, uh, hands up those who want to ask any questions. And then I'm going to pick three people. And then those three questions I'll take all at once, if that's okay. Um, okay, so the lady over there, can we get your question, then can we go to the ge ge gentleman here in the second row, and then can we go to the gentleman with the glasses uh, over there. In a, in a time where trust has fallen massively, um, in the state, in non-government organizations, and businesses, people are relying on businesses to do good more than they ever have been before. Um, so my question is, what's the role of businesses in, in providing democracy and improving society? So I'm going to sum that up with, what is the role of enterprise in each of the three models? Okay, that's fine. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. My name's Peter Bowman. Uh, first of all, thank you for telling us something about integral humanity. I've been uh, interesting and would like to find more about it, and particularly the ethical basis of it and hopefully also the possibility that it offers of raising the debate above this rather, rather sterile ding-dong between free market and, and socialism. And I think, listening to the conversation, it seems that actually these both are ne the government and the market are necessary components of the economy. And I was reminded in listening to this that something Adam Smith said about free markets. Free markets, it's not about freedom from the state. It's about free market freedom from rent-seeking. 
And the hidden aspect of capitalism is this, and I'd say the unethical part, is where people can uh, make a fortune not by doing anything useful, but just by owning something and having power and therefore taking the wealth that others produce. And I think the issue of socialism is that, and that, I would say, is one of the main causes of inequality. And the problem with socialism is it's tended rather than to address these causes, to just uh, ameliorate the effects, which is why things have got more complicated. Okay, thank you. So my question is, really, what do you think of that? What do we think of what? That, 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 that observation. Okay, yep, fine, all right. And we had a gentleman over there. Uh, yeah, that, that's him, yep, over here. No, Ria, just over there. Yeah, that's the one. Hi, my name is Samir. Um, I'd like to bring the debate really to politics today in the UK, and I have two questions really. The first, uh, unless if they are policy questions, I'm going to reject them straight away. So you can uh, rephrase it in a more uh, a broader sense. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and go for a broader sense. Um, I guess with a with a, with a weak uh, Conservative Party today and a. Um, maybe a weak opposition as well. Is there a gap for a, a new third way? And is that new third way integral humanism of one sort? Uh, and the second, maybe you'd reject it, um, is imagine a world in which the, the Conservative Party falls within the I'm next I'm gonna year. reject that, thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> First question was, what's the role of enterprise? And if we can again, one minute answers uh, uh, for, for each of you. So we'll start with you, Andrew, and then um, we'll, we'll come around. Actually, in a way, the two questions were the first two questions were related, both about business. Um, in one minute, um, the point about rent seeking is really good because I think one of the things that a modern social democratic uh, government needs to do is to improve competition rather than to stop it because you have agglomerations of power in the economy and it's really interesting what's happening with the development of new digital technologies with these huge platforms which basically have become monopolies um, where you know if you want to advertise you have to use Google who's the only force who's got the power and clout to stand up to Google it's the European Union because they can do it on a continent-wide basis um, and uh, the role of business I mean partly of course business has to obey the law and you know, pay taxes and all of that. But it has to do more than that. It has to work with partners in society and work with government and work with trade unions for the better of both the business and society. Um, and a brilliant example of that is, um, is training, where, you know, the business benefits if the government and trade unions work with it to help the workforce get better. They get paid more, but the business gets more productive workers as well. Well, businesses intrinsically uh, help society because they provide the services that people want to buy. So that that's, they, they can't really go wrong. Uh, they can go wrong in one way, uh, which is, and I'll get back to the rent seeking. Uh, if they're in receipt of subsidies, uh, if they get the government to do them favours, which they often do, uh, those favours are often regulatory, so they, they get uh, regulations to give them an advantage in the market. and they. I'll tell you a little... Oh, no, I can't got time. Uh, uh, so I, I think that on the whole, they, do, they can do harm in one other case, and that's a market failure. I, there are some market failures where they don't bear all the costs of what they do. So, for example, if they emit pollution, uh, they can harm society, and there can be measures to prevent that, for example, taxing the emission of pollution. Um, so, but on the whole, I think that they, but they don't like this new trend where they're co-opted into government policy. So the government says, we'll only really kind of let you operate if you agree to train people and do this and that. Because again, we're getting the situation where rather than individuals expressing their preferences and freely, the government's deciding what matters and co-opting, coercing effectively, private citizens to do their bidding. Now, I've forgotten the other, there was another question. Oh, yes, about the third way, a middle one. Uh, Yes, I, I actually think I think through a great uh, political realignment in the world today, so that the pol current political parties don't make sense uh, in terms of where the divides in, in the population are. So I think the divides are much more around uh, openness versus closedness in the population than the traditional left and right. So you'll see some people in the Labour Party who are very open and liberal type of people and others who are closed off, so to speak. And I think we are going to see a big rearrangement. I thought the Liberal Democrats might have done a, a little better. 
but maybe, and, and I think what's missing at the moment is any really liberal party. The Conservatives have come very illiberal, and Labour's illiberal. So I hope a liberal party will emerge. Thank you, and the and enterprise, enterprises are very important, and as uh, both of them have said, enterprise on one side uh, creates wealth, and not only that it should create wealth, it should also encourage human faculties to function in uh, very many ways. It encourages innovativeness, it encourages collective work, so that's why creation of wealth for any society is important. And enterprises do help to play a very important role. And apart from that, human faculties have to be developed. Enterprises should be so designed that the human should not become a cake in the whole uh, machine, but his various faculties of innovativeness and other things should be encouraged. That's why enterprises are well. Wonderful. Right. So we've got. We can have three more questions. Uh, again. Less than a minute, keep it brief, and keep it, again, at the political economy, moral philosophy uh, perspective. So we'll have one gentleman here in the front. So can a mic go to that gentleman there? And then, ooh, lots of hands. We'll have the lady over there uh, for the second question, and then the, the very smart-looking young man over here in the second, second row. As long as remuneration or wages are paid according to the skills employed, how socialism is going to bring in equality. At that point, don't you think that universal ethics and spirituality will help to bring in equality? One question that I really want to know. Uh, when we talk about capitalism or when we talk about socialism, we um, there's always we, we see these two concepts in ends, but we fail to realize that now and we we see them in the perspective or from the perspective of developed countries. But we fail to realize that um, we have developing countries. We have Asia, which is one of the large, which is the largest continent. Seconds. Sorry, um, but we need to realize that the developing countries have also found a middle way to it. But the world at large has failed to acknowledge it. And they have failed that how in a country even like India, we have a welfare society. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to frame it for you, I think. Uh, so the framing here for all of us is that often these narratives are projected at a global level to societies that are, they, they haven't gone through the historical di dialectic that maybe the European nations have and effectively these, these isms are projected upon them when there could be actually indigenous and native solutions uh, to their own circumstances. Roughly speaking, I think that's what she said. If she didn't, I apologize. Uh, but that's what if I would like each of you to reflect on. And then the third question was the smart young man over here. My name's Kavit. Um, all three philosophies touched on, I think, slightly different notions of freedom in society, what I'm really interested in is in look, what I'm really interested in is the concept of duties versus rights. In duties versus rights in each one of those um, in each one of those philosophies. Wonderful, good question. Right. Okay. So let's start with the first question, which was actually Andrew. So Andrew, you're on your own on this. So the, the question was, um, if everyone is rewarded according to their skill, how can you reduce inequality? Um, the first way is through tax and redistribution. So that, you know you will never have the market will never produce perfect uh, equality. We agree on that. But there's also a profound question about whether the market is really a rewarding skill and hard work in a in a sensible way that reflects that skill. And the best example of this is the historic divide between men's work and women's work, and how work as that women do gets less paid, and therefore there's an assumption that it is less skilled, which is just absolutely not true, particularly child rearing, uh, education, and caring activities of all sorts. Okay, thank you. And then the, the second question was I have told that integral humanism believes that there cannot be one meta-narrative for all the countries and all societies. 
Each society will have to develop its own philosophy. But what could be the basic foundational uh, points and factors about that? That I have mentioned. That they have to take into consideration man or the individual human being in totality, number one. The relation with society, nature, etc. These things have to be taken into consideration. But, but at the same time, there cannot be one straight jacket philosophy, politically or economically speaking, for the entire world. It is not possible and it is impractical. Do any of you want to reflect on that question at all or shall we move on? We can move on. Okay, so the next question was about duties versus rights in each sort of model. Um, so you can take both terms as you wish, but within a minute, give us your, your reflection. Shall we start with you, Jamie? I, how to do this briefly, I'm not sure. Um, in, in, my, in a free market world, uh, you'll have the criminal law, which would restrict your behavior in various ways. So you don't have a right to do those things, uh, and, your liberty, and that because other people don't have a right to do them to you, you've got liberties. You can go about your business unmolested. Uh, now, but a lot of the... Uh, like take employment, your rights as an employee. Right? Now, at the moment in British, in Britain, some of those come from your employment contract and some of them come from the law. So there are general rules about the rights of any employee. Under my kind of a system, there wouldn't be. They would entirely come from the contract. So you would, you would contract into them willingly. So there would be a great reduction in the quantity of law and therefore far fewer legal rights and far fewer legal duties Yes, yes, the lawyers. Well, there would still be a lot of work for lawyers because you've still got the common law, the contract law and all that kind of thing. But the state isn't involved in it. I mean, it's important to remember that the law emerged before the modern state did. Uh, so, yes, so there would be a great reduction in your uh, stipulated rights and duties from a point of view of regulation. Uh, but you would still have rights and duties that you freely contract into. And the... Um, the end point of that is the right to sell yourself into slavery and the uh, you know most societies that we know in modern times take view that uh, very strongly uh, as taboo and so strongly they've created a human right that uh, we should all live freely and not be slaves and it is a modern creation it, I'm not saying that there is anything um, material rather than um, ethical about that claim but it shows the value of human rights. It's almost like a, a secular religion. And that, um, I think, you know, explains some of the difference between, if you like, that purely contractual view of um, duties and rights between each other having exchanged, and rights that are created by a society together because we all decide we wish to respect them. And they can create duties on each of us in our engagements with each other, but they also create duties on the state. The state has duties that aren't just negative, that it won't imprison you or whatever, but positive in that it will progressively support the development of uh, its people and its country. Um, for example, through the progressive extension of education or equality or good health. I don't think there is any... Uh, contradiction between duties and right, the, no quarrel. Because the duties of some may be the rights of this other and vice versa. That's why ensuring the protection of the rights shall be the duties of somebody else. I'll give you an example that the right of the child in the family has to be ensured and that is the duty of the parents. Likewise, state and society. So that's why Everybody's right has to be ensured and that becomes the duty of various systems in the society. State, society, family, other uh, systems. That's why duty and society, there is no conflict. Both have to be balanced and at every level, duty and rights, they operate together. Okay. Now let me bring in uh, some contemporary issues uh, very quickly to sum up. The question was, is Corbyn's socialism the right response to the apparent failure of capitalism uh, in modern Britain? Or is there a third way and a critical examination of integral humanism, as 
uh, propounded by the Tatoji. Now, when we go to the ballot, let us not, I would argue, now let me just bring in my two pence worth, let us not get sucked into the rhetoric, to the PR, to the, to the, to the razzmatazz of the personalities, but can we begin to look at the underlying values, the political economy of what is happening in modern Britain? Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute Andrew is right, and I'm not suggesting for a minute Jamie is right, I'm not suggesting for a minute there is a third way. What I am suggesting is that they are incredibly different. Incredibly different. No matter how they are presented, they are in, and, and you've got three expert witnesses who do the real hard graft of thinking, thinking policy through, thinking ideas through, who have just presented this view to you in a very earnest, honest way. So Richard Manthan, as far as I can see, has done its job, which is, has left you with a lot more questions and a lot more uncertainty than you came in with. I hope that is the case. Um, and with that, I would like you please to uh, give a big round of a applause to our expert witnesses. And the third, just to add to say that if you, if you are confused with each of these three uh, expert witnesses, then we've done our job. <laughs> so, so on that, I'm going to, uh, again, uh, thank you uh, for, for coming tonight. I'm going to pass you on to Kishin for a final word. Um, I'd like to also give a special thanks to our well-wishers for con contributing uh, to our cause. Uh, the well-wishers are really of the lifeblood of our organization and they contribute uh, small amounts of money quite regularly which allows us to hold these events. So um, if you haven't thought of it already, please do uh, think of it now uh, and go to our desk right in the far corner where Rio is. Um, she's giving her hand, she's giving a little wave uh, to see if you can contribute even a small amount of money, as little as one pound or, or 25 pounds per month could go a long way. We do value your support and contribution. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today and uh, I hope you all have a safe journey. Uh, Pranam and uh, Jessica Krishna, thank you.